Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 15 The Man of the Island From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling into the bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction and saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of the pine. Or what it was, whether a bear, a man, or a monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy, more knew not. But the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides behind me and the murderers before this lurking nondescript, and immediately I began to prefer the dangers I had known to throw I knew not. The silver appeared himself less terrible in the contradiction contrast of this creature of the woods. I turned on my heel and looked sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retract myself in the direction of the boats, and the fi instantly the figure reappeared, and making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired at any rate, but I had been fresh as when I arose. I could see it, it was vain for me, the content and speed with certain adversary. From the trunk to trunk the traitor flitted like a deer, and ma running man-like on two legs, but unlike any man I would ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran, yet a man it was, I can no longer <clears throat> be in doubt of that. I began to recall what I heard of cannibals. I was within an ace of calling it for help, but the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, was somewhat assured me that my fear of silver began to revive in proportion. I stood there, but therefore, and cast for a method of escape. I was so in thinking that the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered, I was not defenseless. Courage glowed again in my heart, and I was set resolutely for this man of the island. He was concealed by this time behind another tree trunk. He must have been watching me closely, for as I soon I began to move in his direction, he re reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, and came forward again. Then at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that, I once more stopped. Who are you? I asked. Ben Gunn. He answered, and his voice sounded hoarse and awkward, like a rusty rock. I am poor Ben Gunn, I am. I haven't spoke with a Christian these three years. I could now see that he was a white man like myself, and his features were even pleasing. His skin, was, however, it was exposed, burnt by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. For all the beggar men I had seen or fancied, he was a chief for the raggedness. His clothes were tatters of old chip canvas and old sea cloth. And this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incredulous fastenings, brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of Terry Gaston. About his waist he wore an old brass buckled leather belt, which was one thing solid of this whole accrontment. Three years! I cried. Were you shipwrecked? Nay, mate, he said he marooned. I had heard the word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment common enough among buccaneers. It was which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and a shot, and then behind in some desolate and distant island. Ruined three years agone, he continued, and lived on goats since then, and berries and oysters. Whenever a man is, I'd say, a man can do it for himself, but mate, my heart is sore for a Christian diet. You might have happened to have a piece of cheese about you now, no? Well, many's a long night I've dreamed of cheese, toastly, mostly when I woke up again, and I were, <clears throat> I hear I were. If I either can get aboard again, <clears throat> said I, you should have cheese by the stone. All this time he had been feeling the stuff on my jacket, smoothing my hands, and looking at my boots. Generally, I intervaled his speech showing a child's pleasure in the presence of a fellow creature. But at last my words 
He perked into a kind of startled slyness. If I can ever get you aboard again, says you. He repeated, why now, who is to hinder you? Not you, I know, was my reply. And right w you was, he cried. Now you, what do you call yourself, mate? Jim, I told him. Jim, Jim. He, said he, quite pleasantly, apparently. <clears throat> well now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, you would think that I'd been a pious mother to look at me? He asked, Why, well, no, not in particular. I answered, Ah, well, <clears throat> said he, but I had remarkable pious, and I was a civil pious boy and could rattle off my chachems that fast, as you wouldn't tell one l word from another. And here was what it come to, Jim, that it began with a chuck farthing of the blessed gravestones that that's what it began with and we went further than that and so my mother told me and predicted the whole she did the pious woman but we it were the providence that put me here and it all been out in this here lonely island and i'm back on piety but don't you don't catch me tasting rum so much but i'm just a thimbleful for luck of course and the first chance I have, I'd be bound, I'll be good. And I'll see the way too, Jim. Looking all around him, lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt that poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude. And I suppose I must have shown the feeling in my face, for he repeated the state statement hotly. Holly, holly. Rich, rich, I say, and I'll tell you what. I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, uh, Jim. You'll bless your stars, you will. You were the first that found me. And at this there came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face. And he tightened his grasp upon my hand. And raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. Now, Jim, you tell me true. In that foot ship, Flint's ship? He asked. At this, I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I had found an ally. I had answered him at once. It's not Flint's ship, and Flint is dead, but I'll tell you true, as if you ask me, there are some of Flint's hands aboard, worse luck for the rest of us. Not a, not a man with one leg, he gasped. Silver? I asked, ah, Silver, said he, that was his name, he's the cook and the ringleader, too. He was still holding me by the wrist, that he gave it quite a ring. If you were sent by Long John, he said, I'm, I'm as good as pork. And I know it. But where was you, I suppose? Do you suppose? I had made up my mind in a moment, by the way of answer, told him the whole story of our voyage in the predicament in which we found ourselves. He heard me in the keenest instrit interest, and when I had done, he patted me on the head. You're a good lad, Jim, he said, and you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you put your trust into Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn's the man to do it. Would you think it likely now that your squire would prove a liberal-minded one in case of help, help him in the clove hitch, as you remark? I told him the squire was the most liberal of men. <clears throat> Aye, but you see, returned Bengen, I didn't mean giving me a gate to keep in the suit of livery clothes and such. That's not my mark, Jim. What I mean is... Would he be likely to come down to the tune of, say, one thousand pounds out of money as good as a man's own already? I'm sure he would, said I, and it was all hands that were good to share. And at the passage home, he added, with a great look of shrewdness, Why, I cried, the, gent the squire's a gentleman, and besides, if we got rid of the others, we should want you to help work in the vessel home. Ah, he said. So you would, it seems, be very much relieved. Now, I'll tell you what, he went on. So much I'll tell you, and no more. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure. He and six along, six strong seamen. They were ashore nigh on a week, and us standing off and on in the one walrus. One fine day up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf, 
and the sun was getting up in the mortal white, he looked about the cut water. But he, there he was, you mind, and the six all dead, dead and buried. How he had done it, not a man aboard could make it out. It was a battle, murder, and a sudden death. Least ways, him against six. Billy Bones was the mate. Long John was the quartermaster, and they asked him where the treasure was. He said, Ah, said he, you can go ashore if you like and stay. He says, But as for the ship, she'll beat up for more. By thunder! That's what he said. Well, I was in another ship three years back, and it was sighted in this island, boys, said I. Here's the Flint's treasure. Let's island and find it. The captain was displeased at that, but my messmates were all of a mind. And landed twelve days, they looked for it. And every day, they had the worst words for me, until one fine morning, all hands went aboard. As for you, Benjamin Gunn, they said, here's a musket, they said, and a spade and a pickaxe. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself, they said. Well, Jim, it's been three years I've been here, and not a bite of Christian diet from that day to this. But now, you look here, look at me. Do I look like a man before the mast? No, says you, nor I weren't. Neither, I said. And I say, with that, he winked and pinched me hard. Just you mentioned those words for the squire, Jim, he went on. Nor he weren't, neither. And that's the words. Three years he were a man of this island. Light and dark, fair and rain. And sometimes he would, maybe, think upon a prayer, says you. And sometimes he would, <clears throat> maybe, think of his old mon <clears throat> mother. So she's alive, you'll say. And for the most part of Gunn's time, this is what you'll say, the most part of his time was to start up with another matter, and that you'll give him a nip like I do. Then he pinched m me again in the most confidential manner. Then, he continued, then you'll up and you'll say this, Gunn is a good man, you'll say, and he'll put his precious sight more confidence, a precious sight, mind that, in a gentleman born than in these gentlemen of fortune, having been one himself. Well, I said, I don't understand one word that you've been saying, but that's neither here nor there, for I am out to get on board. Ah, he said, that's the hitch, for sure. Well, there's my boat, that I made in my two hands. I keep her under the white rock. If the worst comes out to the worst, we might try that after dark. Hi, he broke out, what's that? For that, just then, although the sun had been an hour or two to run, all the echoes of the island awoke and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon. They had begun to fight, I cried. Follow me. And when I began to run towards the anchorage, my terrors all forgotten, while close on my side, the marooned man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly. The left, left, he said. Keep your hand, and keep it to your left hand, mate Jim, under the trees with you. There's where I killed my first goat. They don't come up down here now. They're all mast headed on the mountainings for the fear of Benjamin Gunn. Ah, and there's the cemetery. Cemetery, he must have meant. You see the mounds? I come here and prayed, now and then, when I thought maybe a Sunday would be about due. It weren't quite a chapel, but it seemed more or less solemn like. And then, says you, Ben Gunn was a short handed, no chapling. Nor so much as a Bible and a flag, you say, for he kept talking as I ran, neither expecting nor receiving any answer. The cannon shot was followed, after a considerable interval, by a volley of small arms. Another pause, and then it was not a quarter of a mile in the front of me, I beheld the Union Jack flutter in the air above a wood.